And now, yes, he do, but not with you, Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a church. We got a mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Love that about you. Uh, Phil Hendry, radio show host, was supposed to be here, but he had an issue. So uh, we're going over a bunch of stuff that I've been wanting to get into for the last several weeks, but haven't really gotten into because we've had a guest in the first half of the show. But uh, Mitch Blood Green, that guy is a pretty interesting dude. That's the big dude who had the beef with Tyson, fought Tyson in the ring, went 10 rounds, but uh, famously fought him in the street like uh, outside some bar in Brooklyn. And it has a whole history with Tyson and his own unique, interesting history as well. So we'll uh, get into that with him when he comes in. Um, First, one of the things I wanted to get into that I hadn't uh, gotten into about a week ago, so I went out to dinner with um, my old football coach, Duke Gallagher, his son, uh, Danny Gallagher, got hold of me and uh so duke's still around duke's 93 um duke is uh sharp as attack uh had three glasses of wine during uh dinner wanted a martini but promised his old lady he'd stay with the vino um 93 uh i don't know a lot of it's genetic because uh my dad's the same age and not moving nearly as good as duke is Duke uh, walked in. Duke sat down. Duke didn't uh, walk with a limp or having ordered a rack of ribs. Oh yeah, and uh, some wine. How Did do you tell you? your knee, your uh, uh, helmet's not a seat? Tell me my helmet's not a chair, gentlemen. Are you? Have you been in touch with him, or how does this? How does this connection happen? Now uh, I can show you the picture of uh, me taking my shoulder pads off, and you can see uh, Duke Gallagher in the background. With his red hair and red mustache, and uh, little daughter uh, Kelly, Ugh. Kelly Gallagher, who was uh, the Olympic gymnast, or 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 actually, I found out this story. She she was the one, this cute little blonde with pigtails. I had, I had this big crush on. She was a cheerleader. Duke was the coach. Uh, we'll put the picture up at amcurl.com. It's uh, me, probably about the age of nine, could be eight. I don't know. After the game, helmet off, head full of sweat, always a head sweater. Uh, there's not, boy, if you're a head sweater and a mouth breather, it's rough out here <laughs> because I was a big time head sweater and I was a mouth breather and they thought water was bad for you. So all through practice and games and stuff in the San Fernando Valley, I was just breathing through my mouth, always had cotton mouth and dry mouth and you're you're doing push-ups in like dirt and cut lawns and running and doing shoulder rolls and stuff like that. And all I wanted to do was to wet my whistle. Like I just wanted to get some moisture in my mouth because I was breathing with my mouth just hung wide open like the whole time. And it's 105 degrees in the San Fernando Valley and they would not give you water because they said it wasn't good for you. They said you would cramp up, but it was really like it would make you soft. It breeds weakness. It breeds weakness. <laughs> and they would do this thing where they go, all right, we'd be at Beeman Park in Studio City or North Hollywood Park. And when they'd have us run laps, the laps were pretty straightforward. It was down to the end where the uh, baseball softball diamond is, turn after the backstop, turn up to the next softball backstop, come back to the next. You just go all around the four backstops, which made like a big, I don't know, half mile loop, um, which is fine, except for there were drinking fountains right behind each. Oh. Each backstop had a drinking fountain. And I was like cotton mouth, uh, sweating my ass off, all pouring down my head, dripping down my eyes, wearing the stupid helmet, overheating like a mother in the San Fernando Valley. And they'd go... You guys hit those laps. I don't see anybody slow down at that. If I see anybody do anything about those drinking fountains, yeah. like you're all running and just turn. You're literally cutting on the drinking fountain and turning left and then cutting on the next one. And I'd be like, 
I need water. We're looking at the water meter. If I, there is a drop I, I, I coming out of the spigot. I need water. And, and, and uh, they're like, yeah, I don't want to see anybody. If, if I see anybody gets near those drinking fountains, you guys are all going to go in on more laps. So you couldn't do it. Oh, they runner. punish the whole team if one mm-hmm. person. That's how they roll. Yeah. They punish everybody. So um, Dan turned out to be, you know, they were a successful family. Man, they lived up in the hills. And um, Kelly, the younger daughter, who's a year or two younger, was an Olympic caliber gymnast. Um, and and that's the one Duke Gallagher would go, I daughter's my daughter's female gymnastics team does more push-ups than you wusses do. Now let's go. You know, it was always like, oh God, the girls' <laughs> gymnastics team does more. We're wearing full pads, and I'm dehydrated, but we're doing push-ups. Um, and then I found out that she didn't make the Olympics because that year, 1980, I think it was, was the year we boycotted the Olympics. So she, this girl, works from age four to age 18, and now, yeah, that's her, Kelly, Kelly, Ga- well, Kelly Gallagher. I just showed you a picture of her in an ABC TV series after-school special from 1980 called The Gymnast. Oh, so she's working from age 14 to 18, yeah. and then they get to her Olympics, and we boycotted that. So that was interesting. Uh, something I never, I never knew because um, I played with Duke, is the coach and uh, Dan as his son played and we just rolled all the way through for about three or four seasons and then I went off to the Sun Valley Falcons and I, I don't know what happened to Duke after that. Smart guy, worked in the entertainment business, I think worked over for like NBC or ABC or something. Uh, you know, you And you, you haven't crossed paths since no, no, I don't think so. And and uh, it's weird. Now you you now sit down as adults and you talk <laughs> as adults about their life or you know mm-hmm. what happened. Is your mom still alive? What happened to her? What what happened? To everybody. His mom's not alive. I can. I'll tell you. No, she <laughs> she passed away. Uh, not his wife. Sorry, his his wife at the time ah. is is not still with us. He's remarried. Um, they. Uh, it was funny because I was talking to him. Well, it was funny because Dan, the son, was given his dad grief, who was the head coach, because he started Scott Whitman as the quarterback and not Eric Kramer, the guy <laughs> who played 13 years in the league. Sure. I mean, there wasn't anybody on that. There wasn't anyone on that East Valley Trojans, Gremlins, Pop Warner team that went to the NFL, but there was one guy. And that guy was Eric Kramer, and he did not get the starting nod at does, quarterback. Does he remember the games as vividly as you do, or the moments? Because you're a coach, and these are kids just playing. Like, or does he? Was he just like, I don't know what what dads who coach their little leagues teams are today? I don't know. We we talked about a lot of stuff. It wasn't all just you know glory days stuff. Okay. Um, had like a three hour dinner at the smokehouse, which was great. Also, that's my that's my jam because uh, I'm sitting there with my old coach, and every third person that passed the day wanted to get a picture with me, which made me feel good awesome. because it was nice for him to witness it. So you're in the main dining room in a booth. We're in the main dining yeah. room in a in a booth. See, they see your face and they put you in the main dining room. I have to request a waiter. Mm. That's how I get in the main dining room. Ah, yeah, yeah it was uh, it was good, nice time. Um, Stole one of uh, Duke Gallagher's ribs. You know, I was up front. He was like, I want to get a rack of ribs, but I don't think I can finish them all. I was like, I'll give you a hand. Nice. And they comped us our meal. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. So uh, it was nice getting caught up with uh, Duke and Dan. And then they brought their other brother, Richard, who was a little bit older. I didn't play with as well, but getting the whole scene. Who reached out to whom about... Getting dinner. I think Dan, uh, the son, Danny, uh, tracked me down. I told him had vivid memories of going over to their house and seeing a balance beam in the living room. <laughs> see, back then, if you had any sort of bespoke, well, not bespoke, but but equipment for archery or 
I knew I knew two guys that played hockey that had their own hockey equipment. That blew my mind. Like I, my neighbor had a, his dad had golf clubs. That blew my mind. Uh, my friend Alex had a uh, Rams helmet lamp. That blew my mind. <laughs> like, the, I, first of all, my mind could be blown <laughs> yeah, very easily. Easy. Like, a, 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 literally a bag of Cheetos, and I'd be like, "Where'd you get those?" You know, <laughs> like, like everything was mind blowing. Like baby, well, it wasn't. Uh, you know, Amazon and everything shot. Like, if some kid had a slot machine or something that his dad had in his garage, that was a major thing. That was a major, a pinball machine, a slot machine, any kind of home version of uh -huh. anything, a movie projector and a screen, golf clubs, hockey equipment, <laughs> uh, skis, yeah. ski boots, you know, any, anything of that nature. And I was like, oh, my God. When I saw this balance beam, which was a regulation balance beam, but it was just on a little platform, little legs you know, eight inches above the ground in the living room for her to practice. I was like, oh, unheard my God. Un unheard That'd be weird of. even today, I think. Well, that I'm would be, people. but you wouldn't marvel over, like, that must have cost $80. Yeah, I you know. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it, my family was so devoid of anything I know. that everything was a big deal. Like, if a kid owned a tennis racket or something <laughs> like that, I'd be like, whoa, where'd you get that? You Who know? do you have to know? Who do you have to blow? So uh, I would, and also I always saw I, would, I right by the balance beam, which was in the living room, was the fireplace and the mantelpiece, and it was a picture of all of them skiing on top of the mountain, and that's where my mind was like parkas and mm -hmm. ski boots, and and I was just like looking <laughs> at them all, going, Ooh, "Whoa, how does this?" Those are like the photos that come with the frame. Yes. That's what they looked like. They were a good looking couple. They were a good looking family. And they were winners. And I was like, oh, man. And then I'd go home and watch Sanford and Son and feel better about myself. You know, because <laughs> I didn't like the winners. Everyone's always like, we got to show the examples, but the examples made me depressed. I want to go look at Fred Sanford living in squalor. I and then and I then felt better and... about my own. My own squalor, but I also I still have it now. Like I was, oh man, I I almost had a stroke on Saturday. I was uh, I was it. I was in La Cunada, and I was taking Phil to be boarded for a night because I had this thing at the house, and there's going to be food and stuff like that. Got to get Phil mm -hmm. out of there, you know. So the the, the lady that boards Phil is way up at the top of the hill, like um, Angeles Crest Highway gets up into the hills yeah, there. There's a country club up there. And I was like, I remember dropping Phil off last time we did this. I drove you about, and I checked it on Waze. It was 1.2 miles away. So I was like, okay, and you know what? I'm going to put my 20 pound weight vest <laughs> on and I'm going to walk Phil up to the boarding house. Okay. But I didn't really factor in the elevation. There's some incline. There's some major <laughs> incline. And yeah. when you're driving, you really don't notice it. You notice it. Like, I once rode my 10-speed from, like, Santa Monica to Ventura, to the county line in Ventura many years ago. And I've driven that thing a thousand times. You think, eh, there's a little uphill when you go into Pepperdine or whatever. Ride it on a bike. You have no idea how many fucking hills there are. You do not know how much elevation and up and down and how long those uphills go until you're pedaling a fucking Schwinn. So I take Phil. I take my 20-pound vest. Now, when you do, when you walk Phil, it's, it's like trying to reel in a marlin. It really is. It's like, oh, he's <laughs> under the boat. Now he's going this way. Now he's pulling. And so you're actually. Yeah, go with it. You're, it's like wearing a 40 pound vest because you're pulling what well, he's pulling sideways while you're trying to go straight. <laughs> I you know. know, should have strapped on some balloons. He's got a, he's got four wheel drive, he's 110 pounds, and he doesn't listen. You know, and all he's doing is he smells something over here and he's trying to pull. So now you're walking and he's pulling, he's burning calories too. I got the 20 pounder. 
hit this hill and just like look up and it's endless. And and we get get I say, okay, truck it all the way up to the top, get to the top, look to the left, and it just goes up again. Huge. And Phil's like looking at me. I'm looking at Phil. <laughs> We hit someone's lawn and just flop out. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking about ditching the vest. I'm at the point you where get on the way down. If I'm you need like to. I'm going to stash this vest in a shrub, <laughs> yeah, so I can make it to this person's house with Phil. But I thought, no, soldier on. I'm sweating through my shirt. I got the 20 pound weight You're mouth vest breathing. on. I'm mouth You're breathing. Dry. Duke Gallagher says no water. Phil finds a lawn and just like goes flat on it and just he's huffing and puffing because he's been pulling the whole the whole time too. But uh, finally make it to the top. Drop Phil off. Can make it down now because it's all all sort of downhill from here. But as I'm passing these houses. In my neighborhood, all the lawns have a declaration about their kid. He's made the Little League team. They sponsor the football team. One, the kid made the soccer team. You know those lawn signs, you know, vote Trump or you yeah. know, whatever whatever they, they got on there? They stab him into the lawn. They just stab him in the lawn. I pass a house, there's 25 soccer balls all in the front lawn because the kid made the soccer. <laughs> no, volleyball. Sorry, volleyballs in the front lawn because the daughter made the 10th grade volleyball team. And That's I was just cool. thinking to myself, like, what is there a universe where your parents would take the ball of the sport <laughs> that you made the team on and j- times 25, just go plant them in the yard so that every time you came home and for all to see, all the neighbors and everyone who's walking Phil and just walk by and go, that kid plays volleyball at that, the high school no. level. Unless unless the person was like a paraplegic, maybe I'd understand. Right. So this is everybody in my neighborhood, they got the kids made the academic role. They've got the we've contributed to the school. We're, we're, <laughs> we're platinum club. Or whatever. You're going to a different planet at this point. Oh, my God. I showed up once when the kids were, like, in the fourth grade, and I see the Platinum Club thing in my front yard. And I say uh, to my wife, I go, uh, what is this? She goes, we're in the Platinum Club. I go, how do you get into the Platinum Club? You go, you give five grand. <laughs> I go, five grand? Yeah, five grand. I go, Jesus Christ, five grand? And she goes, no, 10 grand. And I go, what? Oh, for each kid. kid. I'm like, oh, <laughs> wow. 10 grand. Platinum club. Platinum club. Let the neighbors know. Suckers club. They got the football team one. They got the baseball little league team one with all the pictures of the kids on the plaque in front of the house on the lawn. I'm like... All I do is walk around, and I just go, no, oh, God, Jim Carolla. Are you this, kidding me? This is an evolution, because when I was a kid, if you were proud of your kid, they gave you a bumper sticker just to put on your rear bumper. Mm-hmm. And then for the overachievers, they would just stack them onto each other. So they, the, the rear bumper, you couldn't even see it anymore with all the stickers that were from the siblings and the multiple recipients. I saw one the other day that said the kid got accepted to go to, like, Michigan State. Like, they literally... <laughs> And by the way, where does it end? You know what I mean? Like, um, he busts his first nut with a chick, and I got to see a plaque out front of the house. (laughs) I'd like to see those, actually. He got his driver's license, or he got a DUI when he was 23, or or whatever. Is there going to be a plaque? Do I have to follow this kid's life? (laughs) Like, am I going to show up back at the volleyball house in 10 years and realize that uh, now she's married? And, oh, she had a kid. Oh, there's a miscarriage oh, plaque. No. Yeah, she had a miscarriage. Uh, yeah, it's all in the plaque. And she got married. Uh, then she got divorced. Mm. Uh, <laughs> then she got let go from uh, from her job over at the, uh, over at the uh, startup company. I mean, when does, when, she, oh, she made a solid BM. That's an old <laughs> plaque. Like, when does the plaque stop? When, when does it stop? And how much do I need? And all I do is get angry. It's too much information. Because now it's a two-parter for me. I go, my parents would have never done that. And my kids aren't any on any plaques. We didn't put anything. Oh, we got the Platinum Club. Those proud parent bumper stickers came around about yes. when I was in high school. 
And I asked my mom one day, I said, if I got one of those, would you put it on your car? And she said, I'm not screwing up my car. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, they, yeah, a lot of those stickers mess up your car. Yeah, you can't, you got to get a razor and some simple green to get that shit off when you sell it. Yeah, I remember also one of the most, my entire youth, I was just embarrassed. I was just, I was embarrassed for my family. I was embarrassed for the house I lived in. I was embarrassed for the car we drove. I was embarrassed for my mom. I was embarrassed for our dirt lawn. You know, I hated it all. And when I would hang out with the with the Gallagher's, uh, I didn't want them to drop me off in front of my house. I was too <laughs> embarrassed to be dropped off. Like other people want their parents to drop them off, you know, two blocks before school. Uh-huh. I wanted other people's <laughs> parents to drop me off two blocks before I got to my house. You're the big one on the corner. You could just uh, yeah, just drop here. me off. Yeah, they don't do the thing where they wait for you to walk to the door. That was a big deal. No, no, they want to get the hell out of there because one time <laughs> they're in the hood. Yeah, one time I got knocked out of a game, and I think it was that big uh, champion. No, the game I told you we had to play one more game, and then we got to the championship. But we had to play uh, the Valley Bears, the Golden Bears, and then we beat them. But I got knocked out and. And I got concussed, and uh, whoever drove me home, whatever the parent was who who, who drove me home, said, um, "Like you got concussed, like you got knocked out." So they didn't really have a lot of concussion protocol back then, but they were like, "Maybe you know, maybe you shouldn't take a nap or something like that. See how you feel. If you have a headache, go to the doctor. Something like that." <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a semi responsible parent, and. Uh, they were dropped me off. My mom hated football, wanted nothing to do with it, was a conscientious objector. I think kind of conveniently she didn't want to go to the games. So I I got dropped off, and, like, Mr. Whitman was like, I got to talk to your mom and, and, and tell her you got knocked out. And I was like, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. I'll tell her. I'm, like, 12 or 13. She's like, she should know. And at some point they went and got my mom. Who was always a disheveled mess, and they, they had a little powwow on the uh, on the dirt lawn with the crumbling asphalt driveway, <laughs> and uh, it's like uh, Adam took a hit, and we think he's okay, but he was knocked out, and was a little disoriented, and my mom just had a complete fucking hip, oh. hippie meltdown. Like I I want to play football. This is what I'm talking about, and I was like, Mom, shut you up. You knew just this would happen. Him. I had a look. There, it, this wasn't going to go well. I didn't know what direction it was going to right, go. Right, because I, th- I was expecting, oh, like she, you know, she's so lethargic about everything, and have, like, well, it's not like it, it's not like we went and got a cat scan or anything. <sighs> she just had a meltdown in front of the dude about football and violence, and I didn't want him to play, and now this, and and it was just a kind of a, it was just kind of a basic sort of mom. Embarrassing okay. meltdown, which I remember embarrassed. Just peeking sh- through the blinds, like oh, shit, shit, shit out of me. We didn't have blinds. All right, <laughs> blinds, Fake blinds, blinds. What is you have blinds? The White House. <laughs> we blinds. You got to buy blinds. Right. You gotta, you gotta like measure shit and order <laughs> shit. We no, are you kidding? Sorry, we had like beach towels. I thought you were at the Gallagher's again. My bad. Yeah, the blind. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. We had musty old weird ass curtains that were there whenever we moved into the house that that never changed. No, remember where my cat came in through the air conditioning hole in the wall? Uh, that was that was a denim jean pant leg that was thumbtacked. As a flat. We used denim jean pant legs too. We didn't throw away. We used every part of the buffalo, man. We didn't. I, we used those as floor mats, like or like under the like by the kitchen sink. That's what we would step on. I took a denim jean pant leg because we'd make cutoffs. Now you had your pant leg. <laughs> yeah. and you couldn't throw that away because that was valuable. <laughs> uh, we made a flap for Norman the cat, and I sewed one up and cut one up and made a denim seat cover for my unicycle which was which was beat up and there was precedent for it back then because they had like the the denim levi's gremlin and a levi's page that had a levi Uh car interior which sounds insane now but uh yeah we also had during the banquet we had um the scholastic trophy 
that that you could bring a piece of paper in and your teacher would sign off on it just going, hey, he's, he's fair to Midland student or he shows up. Or, he can I, read. Yeah. Thinking back on it, it's like he, they just gave him, then they went, yeah, they just sign it and hand it back. And then you'd get a little plastic scholastic trophy. And I remember when they were handing out the papers, you know, take these papers, bring them to your teacher, get them to sign off. And I was just like, oh, my God. I was like in a shame spiral. I was like, I'm never, nobody, no, I can't hand them this. They're going to wipe their ass with it and, like, start <laughs> laughing, you know. Like, they're not going to sign off on on this. And then I was super embarrassed by it. And I remember just going like, oh, shit, what do I do? And then, every, of course, everyone else handed in their shit. The teacher just signed it and handed it back. And then when we did the banquet, everyone had their little scholastic trophy sitting at the table, like in front of them where they sat, except for not the ace man. Everybody had Trophy-less. their little stupid statue. And it was, I, mine was bare. And I remember just being humiliated yeah. by that. I don't know why. Everything was... Everything was humiliating back then. Nobody's humiliated anymore. No one's I was embarrassed humiliated. anymore. I remember for, for Halloween, I got a baseball uniform, but it was they we were, we were too poor to get a real team, so it just had like some generic name. Yeah, I was so embarrassed. And they would parade us around. I would have my mitt covering my chest, so nobody would see the team and Good. ask me. Humiliation. Uh, so speaking of school yeah. and grades, this a crazy story that Chris stumbled onto with an assist from me, which was um, we're, there's a story that's in the news right now about a student who graduated your high school. Well, yeah, well, it's on the it's it's a really popular true crime story. It happened a few years ago, but I think about it every once in a while just because it's so insane, right? So this guy who was in the grade uh, 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 year after me, he graduated, or sorry, graduated year before him, but he's in the grade after me. Uh, his name's Dan Wozniak, and he was, a, he was a theater kid. I went to middle school with him. Um, I remember he was the first guy I saw that could just ride his bike over a curb. Ooh. Like his mountain bike, and that like I was like I didn't know you could do that with a with a bike. Yeah, and he just rode it over the curb. So, um, so he became famous because after high school he was trying to plan this like really big wedding and honeymoon with his fiance, and he needed money, but he didn't have it. So his neighbor, who was like a a vet who just got back from I don't know, from serving, he's like, oh yeah, I got like sixty thousand dollars from serving in my account. And so he goes and he murders this guy. Mm-hmm. And then to make it look like it wasn't him, he gets on his phone, finds a girl on the guy's phone. It's like, hey, meet me at my apartment. I need to talk to you. The girl comes over, shoots her in the head, and then makes it look like she was sexually assaulted by the guy. And by the way, this is in the guy who was murdered's apartment, right? Mm-hmm. So, so then he thinks he's home free. So everyone's looking for the guy who, who was murdered, but they don't know that. And like, hey, this guy murdered the woman, and they're looking for him, and they can't find him. And this guy, and now Dan is off on his bachelor party with all this money. The way he got the money was because he got the 16-year-old kid to go take his debit card and withdraw the money or, or something like that, right? So, mm-hmm. so then they find the kid, and the kid's like, oh, yeah, well, Dan Wozniak asked me to um, get the money. So they they arrest Dan at his bachelor party for the murder of these two people at his bachelor party for the murder of these two people the guy was murdered and cut up all of his limbs cut up his head and scattered across a local park which i i play golf at a lot and um and that's how and that's what happened he goes to jail i know like his best friends like they i worked with his best friend he'd like refuse to talk about it he Mm. was so distraught right because nobody knew he was just a, a regular theater kid that yeah, nobody could have expected this to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, it was nice. It was you couldn't expect it. So I was thinking about this story, and it, it creeps in my mind every once in a while. And I went to go look it up again and read about it, and I and it ended up being on my high school's Wikipedia page, mm. where it says all the notable people, the alumni that have went to my high school, mm-hmm. and we have a notable criminal section, and there are three listed. Yes, and so it's Dan Wozniak, the guy I just spoke about. The next one, Mikhail. Markasev, who murdered Ennis Cosby during, yeah. uh, during a riot, which just, I just spoke to you about, and we actually yeah. spoke to Godfrey about, which you'll hear about um, next week. And then Jeremy Strohmeyer, who is the guy who murdered seven-year-old Sharice Iverson at the Prima Donna Resort and Casino in Prim, who we yeah. talked about, because 
Um, now, so I had I did a deep dive on this story with Mike August in Vegas two weeks ago after the second show at Kimmel's when I just said, this is the most insane story ever. Uh, this guy's cruising with his friend yeah. through a sort of C-level casino. Right. It's three in the morning or so. Uh, this, I don't know, eight or nine-year-old girl goes into the bathroom. Seven. Seven. He follows her into the bathroom in a casino. Yeah. And then rapes. I don't know if he rapes and kills her or he just kills her. There's sexual assault. And uh, now there's a, there's a lot of blame to go around. First off, the dad is there, too. The, the dad of the seven-year-old is gambling at right. three in the morning. Because these guys are the, – the two guys are 17 and 18. Yeah. And uh, the one guy went to your high school. Well, the other guy probably went to your high school, too. One guy goes in there and sexually assaults her and kills her. The other guy – his friend just hangs out by the bathroom door. And then the controversy starts because this guy keeps getting interviewed about, look, uh, your friend went in there and raped and killed a, a seven-year-old. You didn't and feel, you didn't do anything to stop it. You, you didn't, didn't do feel anything. responsible, like you had to talk him out of it or anything. I mean, that would have been, you know, time for a well-placed dude maintain. You know what I mean? Which would always work to, get, <laughs> yeah. to slow the roll of some of my friends when they're up to no good. But he not only does he not do it, he hangs out, and then when he gets interviewed, not contrite. He's like, not my job. Uh, they always do this thing, too, with all the people get them to trouble. They always go, if you had it to do all over again, would you do it? <laughs> nope. <laughs> I wouldn't do anything different. Like, I, that's your window. Right there to it's just a go. Weird tactic. So this guy. So he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't get charged with anything. He goes to Berkeley. This he, guy is a douche about it. So I, I don't like, know. Dawson. Weirdly, the L.A. Times maybe does an article. There's a couple articles with the friend. Now the one guy gets caught. He's yeah, going to prison it. for the rest of his life. But the other guy, who's an David going, Cash Jr. He's going to be an and This is why he can't do the juniors, people. <laughs> <laughs> you could end up with a Jimmy Kimmel situation. You know, his dad's name is Jim. That's good. But you're also, your kid could be a s smug prick who doesn't intervene when his friend is killing a seven-year-old. And then we got the junior with that, too. He does interviews, and he basically tells quotes. everyone he's not sorry. Oh, you have some, have some quotes? some quotes, yeah. So um, pro in the weeks following... Jeremy Strohmeyer's arrest, David Cash Jr. told the L.A. Times that he didn't dwell on the murder of Sharice Iverson. Quote, I'm not going to get upset over somebody else's life. I, I just worry about myself first. I'm not going to lose sleep over somebody else's problems. 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 Problems are <laughs> where, like, you get a flat and you don't have a space saver spare or you, or you owe the IRS 3600 bucks. This is murder <laughs> he also, problems. He also told the LA Times that all the publicity surrounding the case has actually made it easier to score with women. <laughs> That's the craziest. <laughs> that is Jeez. the Can you? By the way, if this guy's a junior and his dad is a senior and his dad, he goes, yeah, I'm going to sit down and do a, have a little chat with the LA Times. Senior's got to go, hey, dude, my name's yeah. on this shit, too. Now knock it the fuck off. <laughs> we got to go over this. Put a tack in your shoe. It'll, <laughs> it'll help you cry. And all you do is say you wish you had a time machine. Yeah. That's all. Not it's going to help you score checks. So then this guy goes to Berkeley yep. to, be, uh, uh, to be an engineering student. And... Then as I was reading it with Mike, um, Tim Conway Jr., the radio show, maybe Doug Steckler back yep, when it was cut, both of them. They were together, hear about it, and they arrange a, a big rally to get this guy not to be accepted to Berkeley because yeah. of what a heinous individual he is. But he's not technically a criminal. Right. I mean, he didn't hurt, he didn't murder anybody. He was just, so then can you not gain admittance to Berkeley for being a douche. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which is kind of, that's where, we're kind of living in that world now. Like, this person needs to be deplatformed or whatever. It's like, for saying stupid shit? You know what I mean? Like, do we want to fire them from their job for saying stupid shit? And the law kind of at that point goes, you're allowed to say 
stupid shit. Yeah. So I think he went to Berkeley. Yeah, university officials actually said that they had no basis to remove him since he wasn't convicted of a crime. Um, David Cash, in a radio interview, he said, look, it was a very tragic event. The simple fact remains, I don't know this little girl. I don't know people in Panama or Africa are killed every day, so I can't, and I have no remorse for them. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Christ, right? Unbelievable. Listen, I'm not a big fan of media training, but <laughs> uh, it's just the, book the half exact- an afternoon with Bryman uh, and Caffarelli and, uh, and sit down with those guys and let them tell you what to say and what not to say. Or just don't do it. Just lay low. The exact. Don't, don't have a conversation do. with the the L.A. Times, who's looking <laughs> looking to throw you under the bus. So, the guy who killed her. Now, this is a bizarre thing. You are in a casino and it's three in the morning, and you don't. You're not dating this seven year old and caught her with another man. There's nothing premeditated about it, right? You're bumbling around a casino with your jack-off buddy right. looking for good times, right? So you do that, and then you just on a whim go, oh, she went into the bathroom. I think I'll just go in there and strangle her and assault her? Like Supposedly he's super wasted. I, I get the... According to him. The way, Dawson, you've been wasted not, a couple of times, not, right? Not justifying it. Not justifying it. Ever had it. the impulse to uh, go to a <laughs> casino and rape a seven-year-old? Let me think about it. Mm. He's thinking, okay. Mm. No. Okay. So this is just some sort of target of opportunity? Like you're just wandering around a shitty casino? Uh, they never really do it, but, you know, they just convicted the parents of the kid who shot up the school. Yeah, in Detroit. I would argue if you're looking for some blame to go around, hanging out with your seven-year-old, while your seven-year-old's running around the casino while you're sitting there playing blackjack, that's a kind of that's they, kind of laissez-faire that, parenting. Yeah, well, so it, it is, and as a person, as I, that happened to me as a kid, right? I mean, I, I think it was a generational thing. When my family would go to a casino, they would just give us money for the arcade, and we would just go to the arcade by ourselves, seven, ten, whatever. And we just, and we roamed around. That's what happened. So her and her 14 year old brother were just told to go hang out the arcade, but she went wandering off. I, I get that. It's more the 3 a.m. part. Mm. It's not so much the, Here's some tokens. Go to the arcade. It's the it's three a.m. and you're still wandering around the casino. That as a seven year old, that yeah. that's a little bit of shoddy parenting there. Yeah, but this guy just goes in and kills this person randomly, <laughs> and then which is bizarre. And then the Ennis Cosby thing is that's just Ennis Cosby gets a flat up on Mulholland right. and is getting out at 1230 at night trying to fix his flat in this guy from your high school. Same graduating class as this guy. They were freshman classmates. Classmates? This guy's just out driving on Mulholland at 1230 at night. And it's like, hey, someone got a flat. Well, I guess I should kill this person. Like, they're both... Insane, homicidal, random kills. If you think about Mm -hmm. how random, you know, there's killing people in a liquor store, robbery that gone bad. There's all kinds of, there's a carjacking and the gun went off. Like there's, there's crime. These are just two dudes who are 17 and 18 wandering around until they see somebody somewhere and go, oh, yeah, what time? I guess I'll kill this person. Same class. Same class. They were both like 18 same, years old same when they high school. When the, they were both 18 years old when they uh, committed the crime in 97. I want to talk to their fucking guidance counselor. <laughs> that guy did a oh, piss no. poor <laughs> job. Like I would like to literally I would literally like to walk in that guy's office with a picture of these two and headlines ago. Were these your <laughs> Yeah, there's a guy. Oh, no. Are these your do you guys you canceled these two? Yeah, guess what they did. Like I was mad at Mr. Tomey my guidance counselor, just because I left North Hollywood High and started cleaning carpets for a living, which is no, you know, not not a great job in the guidance counseling department. You know, a year out of high school, I'm digging ditches, right? Like probably should have thought 
you know, hey, Adam, you should learn a trade or you should take auto shop or uh, why don't you enlist in the Coast Guard Reserve or something? He, he did know, Mr. Tomey did no counseling, but I didn't turn into a homicidal serial killer. Right. We should look at the guidance counselors Af, like or what what these kids do when they grow up and make sure that they're doing a good job. How do you know they're doing a good job? We should well, be keeping in this touch guy. with these people. And this guy's probably like, he's going to fight back. He's going to go like, well, I told one kid to go to Pasadena City College and he transferred to Cal State Northridge. It's out of my hands after it's that. It's like, all right, he, all right that, oh, we'll count that as a win for you. But... What about... There's a body. You have a body count. There's a guidance Jeez. count. One of them's a seven-year-old girl. The other is the son of Bill Cosby. Yeah. You've done a wonderful job guiding these kids. Crazy, random killings, no priors. Like, hang probably in the same homeroom. You know, they're the same graduating class. And the one kid's hanging out with a kid who's bound for Berkeley on an engineering... For an engineering degree, which is like, how do you two... <laughs> This is strange bedfellows. Un, yeah, you know, it's what unbelievable. I mean? Like I, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, look, and and no shit on. Uh, I, I love Los Alamitos High School. It's a great high school. We have that we is a black great, guy. Listen, we you have know, great alumni. You know what you want? Here's, well. here's what you want to hear. Like, oh, my high school. Carol Burnett went to my <laughs> high school. That's what you want to hear. Yeah. Not, we've turned out more serial killers than any other <laughs> no. any it's other random. high school in the Southland. A lot of guys. Just three. Turn Just out, three real notable ones. Yeah, but. there's schools that uh, are football factories. Got a lot of guys who made the NFL. A lot of guys who made the show and baseball and stuff like that. But in terms of insane homicidal killings, nobody outdoes. And this is now three all large scale, yeah. all gruesome and horrible, yeah. and all weirdly motivated. Unusual. Unusual. Like it just, yeah, it doesn't make sense. There's no pattern that could have predicted it, right? Yes. All right, let's take a break. We'll do some news right after this. I try to cut back on sugar and add a little more protein to my diet, and Magic Spoon makes it easier and more delicious than ever. They have a variety pack, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I love peanut butter. I love the Magic Spoon peanut butter and look a lot of guys a lot of you've done without cereal for a while thinking it's just not not working with the diet that's where magic spoon comes in it has uh, zero grams of sugar 13 to 14 grams of protein and four to five grams of net carbs only 140 calories a serving keto friendly gluten-free grain-free and soy free so go to magic spoon.com slash adam grab a variety pack and try it today You'll be back. You'll be living your youth out again, this time with cereal and not getting all big and bloated. Be sure to use the promo code ADAM at checkout for five bucks off your order. It's Magic Spoon, right, Dawson? Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, start the new year off right with a delicious bowl of high-protein cereal. Head magicspoon.com slash Adam and use the code Adam to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Chime, New Year, everyone. Break up with overdraft fees. The Chime checking account handles the heavy lifting while you get a handle on your goals for the year. Overdraft up to 200 bucks without fees with SpotMe. When you set up a qualifying direct deposit, you can even get paid up to two days early with direct deposit. No monthly minimum balance, no impact on your credit score to apply. Access 60,000 plus free. That's free ATMs. Easy to find one near you with the Chime app. Pay friends through Chime, whether they're a member or not, and cash out your money free. Free with Chime, right, Dawson? Signing up for Chime takes minutes, so join the millions of other Chime members and sign up today. Get started at Chime.com slash Adam. That's Chime.com slash Adam. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. Members FDIC. Spot me eligible requirements and overdraft limits apply. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. In the spirit of Murrow, Jennings, Cronkite, Here's another great moment in local news. 
Now, we all have dogs. Have you ever dressed your dog up? I honestly have not. Well, you got a big dog. That's probably why. She's larger. Yeah. Mark has a little wiener. Have you ever dressed the wiener up? <laughs> yeah. I do. He's, um... <laughs> what are you doing? That's a great, great moment, moment in local news. Now, back to the Adam Carolla Show. All right. We got Mitch Blood Green coming in. We got I'm glad he's news. coming in because of his history with Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's in the news again. Yeah. He has an upcoming fight with Jake Paul. It was just announced. They're going to be mm-hmm. squaring off July 20th. It's going to be on Netflix. Mm. And it's going to be held at AT&T Stadium. It's an interesting move with Netflix, but I yeah. get it. They're starting to get more into the live sports mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so this uh, will be Paul's second bout of the year and Tyson's first since his exhibi- exhibition match against Roy Jones Jr. in 2020, which is, as a reminder, that's also when Jake Paul became a notable fighter after knocking out Nate Robinson in the mm-hmm. uh, undercard of that. Well, now I heard... Mario Lopez talking about this, and he said they're going to be wearing headgear That's and 18 ru- ounce gloves. Right. So there was a rumor about that. Supposedly a leak. They leaked on TikTok. They have um, Jake Paul has said that is not happening. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be no headgear. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, and um, it's still unknown whether the bout is going to be under professional rules or exhibition what's going to what exactly what it's going to be headgear stops you from getting cut mainly mm-hmm. it doesn't really stop you from being knocked out it's it's more cuts right um, number 1 people are just worried like oh it's going to look like a sparring match and we don't want to watch we want to see a real fight 18 ounce gloves if that was the if that's what they're going to go with but i i can't i couldn't it all felt weird so, mm-hmm. so 18 ounce gloves are big and sparring is traditionally 16 ounce gloves maybe they moved them up to 18 but back in the day you would spar with 16 and then maybe go with a 10 ounce for a fight and then sometimes guys would argue over like an 8 ounce or 10 ounce or maybe the lighter weight division guys would go with an 8 ounce or then sometimes there would be arguments like they go like one guy one guy was a big puncher, so he wanted the he wanted the eight ounce gloves. The other guy wasn't, so he wanted the ten ounce gloves. Um, some they then argue over ring size. They go um, the ring. If you were a mobile fighter and you're fast on your feet and 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 that kind of thing, then you might argue for a twenty foot ring versus an eighteen foot ring. So they would negotiate things, uh-huh. you know. I never really, you know what I never got in the negotiation part? Like sometimes you'd see guys boxing and the one guy's got black gloves on and the other guy is wearing red gloves or Mm -hmm. green gloves or something. And I was like, if you're a black fighter and you got black gloves, it's harder to see that than it is a red glove coming at your head in a, in a millisecond or just movement right. off of a black guy or a white guy or a Hispanic guy. Like there are I, rules in other sports, like for <clears throat> sleeves in the NFL, like for like, you can't have it Brown, like the football or like, like mitts, uh, right. like in, in the MLB, you can't have it a certain color. I was watching Rocky two the other day. And I, this is, uh, we forget about this. Everyone sort of knows in, in, in Rocky Two at the very end, they knock each other out and they're on the ground and there's the a ten count. The ten count in Rocky Two is only rivaled by how long it takes the airplane to take off in Fast and Furious Six or Seven, <laughs> where it's like they're going down that runway. How for long tw- is this for runway? T- for twenty minutes, guys are jumping in and out of the plane. Guys are pulling up in cars. Guys are hanging yeah. off the side of the plane. It's like that plane <laughs> just goes and goes. That got, that plane went several hundred miles before. But so in Rocky Two, there's the ten count at the end, and it's five minutes long as you're both like struggling mm-hmm. to get up. But then I watched it, and there is a problem, a mathematical problem with it, which is Rocky lands the big punch on Apollo Creed, and Apollo goes down. Rocky just lost his footing throwing the big punch. Rocky doesn't get hit. So Rocky throws a big punch, lands on Apollo, Apollo goes down, 
and basically Rocky trips over him after throwing the punch, and he goes down. Now, Apollo Creed can't get up because he just got knocked out. He's trying, but mm-hmm. he can't. What's Rocky's excuse? Exhaustion. Now, he's, he's tired. I get it, but he didn't get hit. He should be able to stand back up almost immediately because what they should have done is knocked each other out. But yeah, they both made but contact. But Apollo did not land, only Stallone, and then it took 10 minutes for them to, <laughs> to get up, which is all good. I don't even think about it because that ring was like 12 by 12 or something. It was like a miniature, when you, when you see it now, it was like a miniature ring. But yeah, what's his excuse? Why didn't he get up? Why didn't Sylvester Stallone get up? And why did it take him so long to get up? I mean, he's gassed. Yeah. But he didn't get hit. The one guy's down because he got punched. The other guy's down because he slipped. Right. I'm just saying, if I came up behind you with a snow shovel and I whacked you on the head <laughs> and you went down. Okay. But I also slipped and went down too. I would get up much faster than you. Yeah. Because all I did was slip. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. All right. Um. So... What do you think about this fight? I mean, uh, Tyson looks real good when he's hitting the focus pads. Yeah, you see that video? So oh, he's been posting videos. The body stuff and and all that. But on the other hand, several years ago, he looked that good hitting the mitts when he's fighting Roy Jones Jr. Uh-huh. And he didn't really, it didn't happen in the ring that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's got all the muscle memory in the world, and he's got all the gifts in the world genetically, and he he looks good, but keep in mind, he did that, they did the same footage with Roy Jones, and I was like, oh man, he's going to destroy Roy Jones, and mm, a little lackluster, Yeah, not didn't land that way. Well, and 30-year age gap, Mm -hmm. so that's, I mean... That, that's unheard of, right? <laughs> in boxing? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the oldest was, you know, George Foreman fought, uh, you know, won the crown at 44 or something. Uh, beat, I uh, can't think of his name, in his, in his 20s. Uh, the, there was a, there was a, there's been a couple guys that hung out that long, but uh, yeah, the age difference is, is, a, so is you, a big deal. What do you predict? I mean, um, I, I am, I'm going to go, I would go Jake Paul because, um, Jake Paul's getting better with each fight and, you know, Tyson's old. So, um, mm, he didn't win the crown from Tommy Morrison at 44. Tommy, uh, the Duke Morrison, Tommy Gunn Morrison, who was in Rocky five or something like that. Five, four. That's Tom. Mo- Tommy Morrison is uh, like the cousin of five. Of uh, five, uh, yeah. Michael Moore. That's right. Michael Moore is twenty six years old. Um, yeah. Tommy Morrison had this crazy story. Great left hook. George was forty five. Uh, so that's a pretty big gap there. Twenty years, not thirty years. And uh, there's a big difference between 40s and 50s. You you can hang around. You know, Tom Brady can play till 43 or whatever. You you don't get to 53. That, right. That's a that's a big drop off there. And do you consider Jake Paul's fights professional? Yeah, he's he's seems like he's fought a couple of guys, some MMA guys, some boxer guys. Like I mean, he's he's trains hard, he works hard, and his. He is on the ascent. He he yeah. gets better every every fight, uh, every training camp, and, s- and so on and so forth. But and he's he, fighting guys like from, as you said, MMA guys or retired boxers or retired NBA players. Yeah, like it, it almost feels as if it's like the XFL. Like it's it's its own league. Yeah, I, I got a little more respect and a little more faith in uh, Jake and. Um, it's just time. It's just a father time situation. Mm-hmm. So well, we'll see. I mean, look, well, that's why we have to watch. I know. I'm excited. And uh, the payout is rumored uh, to be that Tyson will get $20 million for this. Yeah. Well, that's why so. he's doing it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All so, right. Yeah. July 20th on Netflix. Um, mm-hmm. So Sharon Stone mm. and Billy Baldwin yeah. are, 
are having a little bit of a feud right now. So there's this movie called Sliver from 1993. Saw it in the theater. You did? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard it was terrible. Well, look, you guys have to understand. We didn't have 17 streaming services and everyone was doing something all at once. There would be a movie would come out and then two months later, another movie would come out and you'd either see it or you didn't see it. But but you didn't go to the movies because it was a quality product. You went to the movies because you're going to the movies Mm -hmm. like, you know, going to eat like, you know, when we went to eat. On a rare occasion, we went to eat the neighbor, uh, Pat, uh, or Dorothy Gravich. You know, we'd go to Shakey's. You know what I mean? Like, we weren't going out to have a dining experience. We, we, there was this notion of we're eating outside of our house. And you would go to a movie just to go to a movie. Right. It's like, we got air conditioning. That's check number one. Do not have air conditioning outside of this establishment. <laughs> Number two, you can sit there with a soda and popcorn or whatever, and we're just going to sit here. And, and that was the experience. Now, if the movie was a great movie, that's great, but that's uh, beside the point. Mm-hmm. The baseline is we're going to see a movie. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And, and do you remember this movie? Because, I mean, I hear it's, it's, it was quite steamy. Yeah, they were trying to capitalize on the whole Sharon Stone um, like basic instinct, basic instinct stuff. thing, and she had some ho- sexy hot stuff, and yeah. then it was that. And I don't remember if it was any good or not. Again, we didn't even judge if a movie was good or not. We just went to a movie. <laughs> That's all. That's where the bar was. Yeah, and even shit we weren't interested in, like like this. I mean, this movie was almost going to be NC seventeen, right? And it's now like on the cusp, she was complaining. That uh, well, first she in her memoir she's like, hey, there's a producer in my career that told me I should sleep with a co-star, and then it came out on a recent podcast that the guy, the producer she was talking about was Robert Evans. The name Bob Evans Bob. gets ink. That's right. Yeah, and supposedly she went into his office and he was like, Robert was like, look, Billy, he's he's not doing that great in this movie. We need. If you could sleep with him in real life, I think that the chemistry in your sex scenes would improve. Mm-hmm. Would you? Could you please sleep with him? But supposedly they hated each other while mm-hmm. working on this movie to the point where she actually re- Sharon Stone requested stand-ins whenever, whenever possible, mm-hmm. um, to act with because she just hated working with him. And so she she said that uh, yeah, she didn't sleep with him, but she was asked to by Robert Evans. So then Billy Baldwin hears about this and he goes on social media. And, and claimed that Sharon Stone had a crush on him, and there's so much dirt on Stone. Maybe he should write a book about it because there's just so much juicy stuff that he knows about her. And, uh, and Sharon Stone is nuts. And supposedly Billy choreographed the final sex scene with Robert Evans' approval so he wouldn't have to kiss her. Um, so here's the world we're living in, and I'm never really sure what's going on anymore because everyone has some version this of is 30 what, years what happened. Later. All right, first off. Bob Evans is nuts, but Bob Evans also could have been joking or some version of that when he told her. I don't think he commanded her to sleep with her co-star. Not command, but it asked, suggested. Yeah. Well, okay. That- well, okay, but here's the world we're living in, right? We're living in a world where all these people have all their all their versions of right. everything that happened. And Whatever theirs is, I would say, go ahead and deduct 30% from that. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Sort of the version of like, guys would go, oh, I got in a street fight with this guy and he was 6'4", 250. All right, round down to 6'1", 210. Do you know what I mean? Like, round it round it down. If, if, if Bob Evans did what Bob Evans did, I think we'd get a bigger version of of what what she so he he she would have said he demanded I do this or he fire me from the film or something she would have given she's she's an inflator mm-hmm. so if she gives and now you, he's dead if so you, if you give this version of what Bob Evans said uh, Bob Evans would probably go uh, we're having martinis and I've made a joke or some version of that also you have uh, we just had. Uh, 
Think about every single thing that Trump says. He's going to be a dictator day one. It's going to be a bloodbath. All the stuff he says and how everyone just runs with it. You know what he said? Do you know what he said? Now picture that times everything now. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's where we're at. Yeah. That's the times we're living in. What if I told you Bob Evans went to my high school? (laughs) You should see the kid stays in the picture, everybody. That is a great doc. That is a great Bob Evans doc. Anyway, listen. I told you I was driving through Pasadena once. I see someone in a convertible Aston Martin back when nobody had an Aston Martin. And there weren't many convertibles. It was a DB7 or something. And I was like, who's in this convertible? It was Sharon Stone. And I thought, she's nuts. Because (laughs) people are going to follow her ass home. See, Sharon Stone... Drawing a little too much attention. In a convertible Aston Martin. And uh, I thought something's, something's up with her. Something's up with her. Okay. All right. Well, Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but uh, I do I do like Baldwin's pushback. I, we'll have to wait for his, uh, his memoir to find out the real story then. Um, so, Shigechi Nagishi. Mm. You, you may not know the name, but you know what he did. Hmm. He died, well, first off, he just died at the age of 100, but he invented karaoke. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. he, so he was one of the, he, he used to go around selling this machine called a Sparko box, mm-hmm. and which eventually became the karaoke, karaoke machine. Mm. And yeah, so thank you to him. But I know yeah. you, you've had a history of singing karaoke. I do, but I, I knock it out of the park. You go for it. You got to commit. I commit. I go. I go fucking hard. I lean in hard, and I and I listen. I don't want to hear any more fucked out karaoke songs. What are those? Anything from Greece. I don't want to hear any Greece. Yeah. I don't want to hear New York, New York. I've I, got friends in low places. Is a guaranteed. I, I don't want. The, the stuff that we can all see coming way down the road. I want, you know, I would do Hell is for Children by Pat Benatar. I would do The Kid is Hot Tonight by Loverboy. You know The Kid is Hot Tonight? You know The Kid is I Hot do. Tonight. You're just saying that now. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't know, you don't well, know it, but okay, you'll what, know it. What am I supposed to say? You, if I say I don't know, you go, oh, you know it. So well, I say I do know it. You're like, you, oh, don't I, you don't know, know what know I'm it. talking about, but you do know the song. <laughs> yeah. I my I bat 100, 1,000% on songs I tell people they know that they think they don't know. You know The Kid <laughs> is Hot Tonight. Dawson, now you got to find The Kid is Hot Tonight. <laughs> then he's on the phone. He'll find it. Um, then I do, um, uh, when I'm with you by sheriff, you know, that's a big one mm-hmm. for me. And, uh, and then there's always vehicle by the uh, Ides of March. Yeah. And, uh, but okay. Those are deep cuts. I want deep cuts. I don't want basic. You're not going to find, you're not going to find those. And like, so you go to a karaoke bar these days and they have just that binder. Yeah. Oh, this is it. Yeah. I mean, if you can wake up an eight year old and make them cry. That's good. That's that's you're rocking hard. My I, uh, my karaoke go to, and I do this on on the cruise ships. Izzy hosts the karaoke nights on the cruise ships, and I do uh, both parts of the duet. You don't bring me flowers. Mm. I do the Babs and I do the Neil. Wow! And it, it <laughs> I would accept that. Every time. Yeah, you know, we went on a. I told you guys many years ago. Me and Jimmy went on a cruise, and we immediately went right to the karaoke spot, you know, first night on the ship. And um, the way the guy who ran, I hope Izzy doesn't run his karaoke like they ran their karaoke. Because you would sign up. You would sign up and you'd put like the song that you wanted. And and Jimmy did uh, Crotochrome by uh, Paul Simon or Simon Garfunkel, I guess he... He'd do a lot of Simon Garfunkel and, and Huey Lewis, you know. And then, of course, I was going with deep cut shit, you know. And so what the guy who ran the karaoke night was in a room. And he's like, all right, who's next? What do we got? We got uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel. Come on up here. And then Jimmy would go walk up there. And then uh, he'd walk up to the guy and the guy would go, 
Uh, yeah, we don't have uh, Working for a Living by Huey Lewis. And he'd go, so you can sit it back down. <laughs> you go sit back down. Yeah. And then they'd, I'd come up there and I'd go, who's now? Adam Carolla. Adam Carolla, come on up. And then I'd go up there and he'd go, <laughs> You're ready to go. Uh, Let's go. We don't have The Kid is Hot Tonight by Lover Boy. So uh, you, you sit it back down again. It's like, <laughs> but back of the line. How are you running your karaoke <laughs> night where you call the Look person ahead. up and then. You tell them you don't have the song, and then they have to go sit back down again. Yeah, that's, a little too fast and loose. That's no, how they, they have. First of all, they have everything these days. Right. This much. is and even on the cruise ship. This is like able this is 1997 everything. or something. You know, <laughs> so they did not have everything. They just have what they packed in a steamer trunk, and that was not the best of Lover Boy. I can I can promise you that. But the guy kept calling people up, and then setting sitting them back down again. Which I just don't think is the way to run your your karaoke bar. That's all. All right, what else? Um, Well, speaking of bars, so there is a bar in Milwaukee, the Mothership, Mm -hmm. it's called. And they have declared that during the RNC, which is scheduled to hold its 2024 convention in Milwaukee, they shall be closed. Mm. Just because they don't want to deal with, quote, the tomfoolery. Mm. Of the convention, so now they're getting review bombed. Mm. Once once word got out um, on Yelp, and they're just sticking to it. And like, look, if this was the Democratic convention, we would do this too. But mm. yeah, so they're closing business, and this is supposedly a time when mm. you should be making a lot of money. There's going to be a ton of people in the city. A lot of people are. A lot of bars are partnering with alcohol companies and doing big events and things like that. So the fact that they're closing. Um, they just they just don't want to be involved with any of it. That's a weird thing. Like a convention is coming to town, basically. You yeah. Stay stay open extra hours. The prostitutes all show up. You yep. sell a ton of booze. Like uh, seems political to me. I, because if the Super Bowl came to town, then you wouldn't close it out because oh, the Raiders fans are rowdy. You just sell more beer, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So they'll be they'll be they'll be closing and. Um, yeah, because he said, quote, fuck that noise. I'm not trying to get involved with or actively take money or rent the space out to that kind of stuff. So, I bet if you did a little search of this guy's history, you might find a uh, I'm with her Hillary Clinton well, uh, bumper you would sticker think, but somewhere. He did say, remember, he, if this is the Democrat National, National Convention, I wouldn't do it either. Well, that's what everyone sa- says when but they're... You can't prove it, yeah. Every judge, every person goes, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, but... But he said, I probably would do the same thing, especially with what Biden is allowing to happen in Gaza. Ooh. Oh. Oh, so he's left of the left. Oh, Biden's too. too. Yeah. So this makes my point. He's hard left because anyone who blames uh, Biden for Gaza is not a Trump voter. That's a hard. That's a Bernie Sanders AOC wing squad. That's the squad. Camp. I don't know. I mean, he did he he did this interview with Rolling Stone. Oh, so, you're right, right down the middle. Yeah. Anyone who's has issues with Gaza is either hard left or a kind of a very niche right kind of Rand Paul Tucker Carlson. Like we shouldn't be getting involved with any of these skirmishes, right? Kind of uh, thing. But. Uh, the ones who think the kids are all being killed and, you know, and, and uh, this is um, unfair warfare and all kinds of th- – those are all the hard lefties, yeah. which is now a weird thing for them – needle for them to thread. And then it's weird because uh, Michigan seems to have the most people that are sympathetic to Palestine in it because uh, they've gone fucking batshit crazy over there. And so Biden has to try to – make nice with the batshit crazy <laughs> part of his wing, which is weird, and try to kind of steer it down the middle, too. So he's going to have trouble because they're pissed at him for his support of Israel. So he then says, I don't like Netanyahu, and they should wrap this up, but then he can't do anything about it. So right. they're pissed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you hear in uh, Texas there, they banned Pornhub? I, yeah, so because because they need uh, to have more age restrictions and and they're just they're just against porn out there, I guess. Seems, so, that so, seems weird. So the so the uh, 
the search for VPNs in Texas has gone up like 400% mm-hmm. because that's the only way that you can you can watch porn. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, the porn sites just have the RU18 and I so That's was, a little easy to bypass. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a super computer nerd, but even I can get past <laughs> that one. And I was literally thinking about it the other day, like is there any chance that any human being I went to high school with at 16 and a half would be like, well, technically not 18, so no boobies today. Nope. But I know how I'll be celebrating my 18th birthday. Right. Uh, there's not a human being who finds his way to one of these porn sites who is under 18 who is thwarted by that little box <laughs> that, you, that yeah. you have to hit. There is no honor system in the <laughs> No. <laughs> no. So obviously the government tells them they have to put that up, but how can yeah. they even? Well, they're saying it's, it's biologically addictive. It's proven to harm human brain development. So Pornhub's really upset about it. They're, they're obviously trying to fight it, but. I wonder, you know, like if there's a retinal scan for age in that, not hooked up to a database, like you look at a young child's eyes, you know, like, like uh, newborns oftentimes have blue eyes, you know, but they change, you know, mm-hmm. they're a lot of, my kids had blue eyes when they were born, but we don't have blue eyes. So they, they changed. But uh, you look at a, a young person's eyes and then like you look at like Joe Biden's eyes, right? Or you look at Joe Biden's eyes from 20 years ago and look at them now. Okay. You know what I mean? They look different. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And I wonder if you did a retinal scan like w- when you do at the at the airport for clear or something like that. They got it would they could tell the difference between a 9-year-old's eyeballs and a 10-year-old's eyeballs, right? I would hope so, but it it doesn't even have to go that far. I think if you just register your face, like everything's like face ID now, and then you're yeah, over but 18. I, I'm just saying minus. I I don't know who wants to register at the porn site. It's all well, just I'm register saying. it like with the government. Oh, I, but I, see, a lot of people don't want to do mm-hmm. that. I'm just saying we people are trying to not to register with things after COVID and Canada and all the other shit, all their plans of like, Oh, we'll do a universal yeah. income then and you get all the porn digital. junk mail. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's enough technology to hold a phone up to your eye and go verify that is a 14 year old's eye. Right. That is not 22 year old <laughs> eyeball. That I seen some I shit. Don't, I don't. Yeah. Yes. That eye has <laughs> been around and seen some shit. I don't know. I know there's a difference. I, I'm sure they could do 10-year-old and 90-year-old. So if they could tell the difference between a 90-year-old eye and a 10-year-old eyeball, then maybe yeah. they could do 14 and 18. I don't know. Pornhub, if you're listening, look into the That's eyes. That's right. Look into the eyes. If you want scam. Texas to, to move mm-hmm. along here. Yeah. Porn. Phone. Jesus Christ! The they internet. said like like the the age of uh, kids who are finding porn gets lower and lower every year. Oh, listen, I, it's a, it's a it's a weird thing. But like when I was talking about at the beginning of the show, when I was talking about Duke Gallagher and he had this pretty blonde gymnast daughter, Kelly, she was a year younger than us. I mean, I was nine and had a mad crush. I had a crush on her. You tell Duke that? <laughs> Probably. I was just eating his ribs at the time. <laughs> Your daughter but, was hot, man. But I was like, I, I was like, I had a crush on her when I was nine. Like, so not, not to mention 13 or 14. I mean, that shit, yeah, it has to. Yeah, I mean, oh. it's crazy. I mean, oh, you turned into an animal. Oh, I, <laughs> yeah. I babysat and. I don't, you know, I know women are constantly talking about how horrible men are, but when you're a 15, 16-year-old boy going through puberty, they have no, I I am amazed how little of these horrible, you know, sex crimes there are considering what all, everyone's brain is it's, corrupted and polluted and going insane. Yeah, right? it's, like, it's like there's nothing else that mattered at a, a, a point. It's like 
That's oh all I could God. think about. And all I cared a, about. A situation where, like, oh, the girls are coming over for a swim party, oh. and then not that we had a fucking swimming pool, but the swim party, and they're getting changed over there behind the thing, and uh, there's like a roof, but there's some space in between. You would have been on that roof trying to peek, like all this shit. They call criminal behavior <laughs> and what you locked up for and go and everyone acts surprised about it. like, oh, my God, he did what? Oh, they were in the they were changing over there. And then he was on the fence of the neighbor's house trying to look into the. Oh, my God. It's like, do not be surprised, people. That's what dudes do. That's how we roll. Yeah. Especially at 15, 16, 17. At some point. We try to rein it in, get it in check, and and figure it out. But, uh, you know, oh, Bob Evans said I should sleep with – yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how we do it. That's – that's. look at a history book. That's how it works. All right. Uh, Charles Farrell is a very interesting guy, and Mitch Blood Green, who's a very interesting guy. Oh, yeah. Former boxer and beef with Tyson and, oh, so many great – Great stories. And Charles, uh, he's a fight fixer. He's in the part of the mob. And a jazz musician. I mean, it, it's crazy. So we'll talk to those two about their trials and tribulations right after this. Viator experiences are what people love most about travel. Whitewater rafting, Hawaiian catamarans, a Catalina zip lining. Yep, done it all. Paid for it all as well. Viator's website and app for booking travel experiences like the Grand Canyon Skywalk or a guided tour of the Vatican. Over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, millions of real travelers' reviews. And um, you get the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. Chris, you use Viator for your honeymoon, right? Yeah, in Italy. And I remember Jonathan Kite, who's been to Italy a ton, he... He insisted that I, when I do the Coliseum, I make sure I get the underground tour and uh -huh. go through all the underground parts of it. I couldn't find it on any site. I went to Viator, and they actually had it, and it went in a big group tour. They literally dig deep. <laughs> With Viator, there's always flexibility and support, free cancellations, payment options, 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now. Use the code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking with the app one app over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember do more with Viator on the Jordan Harbinger show you'll hear amazing stories from people that have lived them from spies to CEOs even an undercover agent who infiltrated the Gambino crime family you're about to hear a preview of the Jordan Harbinger show with Jack Garcia who did just that my career was 24 out of 26 years was solely dedicated working on the cover I walk in I'm in the bar now, there's a barmaid there, good-looking young lady. She's serving me drink. Hey, what would you like? I Usually, my drink was, give me a kettle, one martini, three olives, glass of water on the side. I finish the drink. The guys come in. I'm going to go. Go in my pocket. Take out the big wad of money. Bam, I give her $100. If you're with the mob, I say, hey, Jordan, you're on record with us. That means we protect you. Nobody could shake you down. We could shake you down, but you're on record with us. For more on how Jack became so trusted in the highest levels of the Gambino organization, check out episode 392 of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jim Carolla's 92nd birthday. Here's a list of all the things Adam Carolla will do before he dies. Empty the clip of an enormous machine gun, drop it, pull out a pistol, and keep shooting. Just one of the things Adam will do before he dies. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla show. All right. We got a couple of guests. Charles Farrell is in here. Mitch Blood Green is in here as well. Boxing is the topic of hand, but there's more we can uh, get into. Uh, Mitch uh, famously had the beef with Tyson, fought Tyson in the ring. Mitch, professional heavyweight. Um, fought Tyson outside of the ring um, as well back in the day. Um, so where did the beef start with Mike Tyson? It started to Don King ripped me off. Oh, Don <laughs> King ripped you off. See, I asked for Tyson when I got the fight. But he lied to me about the money and the price and whatever. So when I got to New York, everything started coming out to me and the, the press. They talked about the money. So I thought I was trying to say, give me more money than that. And I was, getting, I was getting mad. 
And um, he didn't beat me, trust me. I didn't, I didn't get no sparring. The room they gave me was little, raggedy, dirty room. They took everything to, to, to discourage me, throw me off my fight game. I was strong, I was handling it. I kept jogging. My trainer, they, they, was at the camp. We came from, to New York. They took the trainer. I did. But I still ran. I trained. I do that. I do it. I told him, I, I said, what they doing to me? But I, I said, they ain't gonna, he ain't gonna beat me. I'm gonna still fight you. So, he, ain't, he ain't beat me. He can't know. Uh -huh. That was several months before he got the championship belt, right? No, no. I made him champ. Fight Don, Don King needs to take my ranking to fight for the title. But he sold me out. I said, the funny thing about it, the man, he's getting like, like a million dollars or something like that. How much, how much did they gave me? 30 grand. Man, ain't that it's a bit? 30 grand. That's why I got pissed off. Was it 30 grand? That's yeah, an interesting they, backstory. And they tried to act like I knew what I was getting. I knew what I was getting. Hold on. I just guessed the amount of the price right. to, 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 <laughs> to the dollar. To the dollar. To the exact dollar. Well, I did I, not know. I, I, I just I guessed. Tell, I can tell you don't box when you talk like that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a boxing coach. <laughs> We're not the new one taking the punches in the head. A couple, uh. a couple, not as many as most. <laughs> You're not a punch so far, you can't think. That well, was a good all right, death. so hold on a second. Tyson, you fight. I mean, Tyson's pretty much in his prime at that point. Very, yeah. very, 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 very much, much yeah, that's on the why, way that's out. Why, that's yeah. why they sold me out. Right, and you go 10 rounds with him, so it's respectable, right? That respect, right? Yeah, did. not off his feet. Right, right. A Which good at the fight. time was the first time. It was yeah. a sparring session. That was not a fight. I didn't fight him. He know I didn't fight him. That was a sparring session. I was trying to go, to make sure I go 10 rounds, make sure I go distance, because fighters, when you get tired, you get around gas, that's your blank. So you don't want to get tired. So I, I was hitting on a lot of punches, but a lot of punches were one with authority. And when Judge Ford for Ali, he bang, 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 trying to knock him out. He got tired. So did, um, then what happened with the fight in Brooklyn outside of the bar? Nah, I'm Harlem. about to tell you, because he's Harlem? Like, Harlem. Yeah, Makes nah, sense. Because, because <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely, he, yeah, I was on some, some site, sitting in that line, telling my how he was hitting on me, and I popped up, and he, it was bogus. I was trying to get a rematch. I was, see, a lot of people know me in Harlem. I've been in Harlem. I was, I was driving, and they told me Mike's down the block. I said, get out of here. They said, yeah, he's really down there. So I saw the road toy. So I went down. I never been to this club, Diaper Dan. I never been to Diaper Dan. Club. <laughs> that, yeah, Diaper, Diaper Dan. So I don't do that. But anyway, when I saw him, I was trying to get a rematch. I was, I was, Oh, oh, I see. I'm talking about that like, Don King beat me. You ain't beat me. Right. And I said, yeah, and I kept pushing. But this is the funny part. When I was cursing them about the free match, the crowd was going, ooh, ooh, that, 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 that's what got them. That's what got them to fight. Yeah, she, 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 I was calling them names. But I said, you ain't beat me. Yeah, I, I said, I won't, I won't say that. But the crowd... You egg them on by go, ooh, like I got a good one. Mm -hmm. Charles, what, uh, how do you fit into this fight game? Well, yeah, I good. was Mitch's manager for a while. Broke his hand. And, uh, <laughs> and also Leon Spinks as well? Yeah, I have a, an interesting track record of the guys I represent. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Charles, let me say just one thing. Sure. That too. When you hear me, he broke his hand. One shot. Right. Tyson. Yeah. Right. And then I was trying to get to him. And I was, and I was, I was trying to get to him. He ran. He jumped in his car. And I hit the window. And the people was holding me. And he's looking at me. He started, and he started the car. I grabbed the side view mirror trying to hold the car. That's, that's how bad I wanted him. Right. And when he drove off, the mirror broke in my hand. Mm -hmm. So all these lies he's talking about, this guy he's trying to say now, which he never been saying. He never, never talked back. Now all of a sudden he... He can't beat me. 
Well, you know what's interesting is for a while, Damn I had the really. deposition from both of them because uh -huh. I sued him. And in the deposition, Tyson says, I was very, very frightened of this man. He says, mm. he's a big man. I was very afraid of him. Well, Mitch is uh, big. I wouldn't say big for a heavy, but tall for those days. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, they didn't, uh, if I was big, I'd be so strong as you right. That's they, they didn't go as, I mean... It, Obviously, Tyson's short for heavyweight, mm -hmm. but uh, they didn't they didn't get much over six two back uh, back in the day. He's a midget heavyweight. It, uh, but Leon Spinks was his own character, right? I love yeah. Leon Spinks, but Leon Spinks was very much his own character. Yeah, yeah, yeah my man. Leon was and then man. there was Michael Spinks, right? Who Wonderful the, fighter had the title yeah, as well. I, didn't know, fare but, well with Tyson, as I, as I, as I recall. I I Seventeen point one million dollars. Ah, wow, really? Yeah. Seventeen point one. That's million. why they did. They, they, they know Don King know I had him. See, Don King lied to me. Well, Don they, King they, probably they, ripped a few people yeah, off. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right? that's why he get he don't get hit. In fact, he gave me a belt. Oh, man. You know, Don Queen. You remember. Don all right, Queen. I'm going to ask you a piece of trivia. I'm glad you left, Don I'm Queen. I'm Charles. Uh, there was. So, Michael Spinks fought with a knee brace on some of the time. Right. Do you remember the other heavyweight who fought with a knee brace back in the day? I remember there was a. I know there was a heavyweight named Craig Bojanowski who who had this guy was a top ten guy. Yeah, same my, era, my, my man. yeah, same era basically. Maybe a little later. You ready? Yeah. I'll give you the name and then you'll know yeah. it. Yeah. Joe Hip. Indian. I got some great stories about Indian Joe Hip. <laughs> I know there's there's not too many guys that fought with a knee brace on. You yep, right. picture it. You never you never saw it, but Joe Hip. Indian Joe Hip. Right. Blackfoot T Indian from Yakima, Washington. Top 10 guy. Tough guy. Tough guy. I give him credit. He's going yeah. in with injury. <laughs> and you remember he wore a knee brace. He did wear a knee brace, yep. He, I, he was fighting for the heavyweight title. He was going to fight um, Bruce Eldon for the heavyweight title. Mm -hmm. And I sent a sparring partner out to him mm -hmm. who he couldn't hit. Mm. And Joe Hip called me one night drunk beyond imagination he says what are you sending me this guy out for tell him to stand still so i can punch him i said <laughs> wow. well you're getting ready for a fight right don't you think it's maybe a good idea to get some good work in and then the line went dead but really <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah serious that's drinker. same era right the same era yep yeah i, I got bragging right i ain't never been knocked out you never been knocked down or knocked down all right uh, that's what's throwing it out there <laughs> Yeah, there's not too many of those guys who can I'm trying to think there are any heavyweights that can lay claim to never Make being sure knocked right. down. George Chavalo. Chavalo, yeah. Chavalo was never down. And a lot of, a lot of, in fact, Charles was my manager. He, my, he was my manager trying to give me fights. Is he, Leon Spink still with us? My no. manager. When did he pass? Yeah, Leon. A couple of years man, ago. Yeah. 2021. Yeah. So he was a huge character in the yeah. in the game back then back then with the big gap in the teeth and, yeah. and, and, and he would make it into all the monologues for Carson and right. Bob Hope jokes and yeah. stuff. He became this crazy sort of sports punchline just because yeah, he seemed like such a girl. such a character, right? He was. Yeah, he really was. He really was. Yeah. But he was a beautiful guy. Yeah, you, knew, you knew Leon, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah beautiful well, guy. He's all turned in Don King's camp. And King, uh, King ripped off Everybody? Not everybody. Yeah. Most my, everybody. My checks always arrived in the mail. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah. see, it's the way he got me. But like I said, it's on YouTube. It said, when Mitch Green turned down King. Mitch, did there you was call, a... Did you caught that? Oh, sure. There did, was a... Uh, I Adam, should, did you catch that? Yeah. I saw the doc. There was a documentary <laughs> so like, a few years down. ago. He what ripped was, me off, man. Try to figure that down. I did not know that man was getting that kind of money. Hold on, let me give a plug. Thirty grand. I should get. Yeah. I should get a lot of credit for guessing thirty grand yeah, and Joe yeah, Hip. That was good. That Joe was, Hip that is, that was a, good. is a tough one. Yeah. Find a picture of Joe Hip fighting. You will see grand. a guy wearing a knee brace. Very yeah, rare. Anyone, uh, uh, by the way, a memoir of jazz, fight fixing, and the mob. Low no, no, oh, I, I should say low life. Can I say one more thing? That's, that's, that's when I found out 
that, see, I was Don King's fighter when he got the fight for me. And he told me what I was getting. So I said, well, how much is he getting? He said, a little more. <laughs> little? All right, so I went along with Then when I found out what he was getting, uh, I mean, that, How much did Tyson get for your fight? I did it's just, it's once something. So I said a man that was on you just said a meal that he said seven hundred and fifty. What do you what do you make of all the sort of stunt fights that are going on now? Tyson, Jake Paul, that kind of stuff. Is it good <laughs> for the sport? Is it bring attention to the sport? Is it what we needed because the UFC's taken over? I mean I, is all publicity good publicity? No, nah, no, nah, not really. Charles, what's your take? Yeah, I would you knock the game. You, you know, the way Damn. people make a living is their business. And if they can make a lot of money, more power to them. And I think these guys are making a lot of money. But as a guy who grew up in boxing, it offends me to see someone like Jake Paul make money. And it offends <laughs> me to see Jake Paul fight guys like Mike Tyson. I assume they have an arrangement. Um, you know, that would be yeah, the smart thing to do. No, you assume they have an arrangement. Yeah, I do. Yeah, what does that mean? There ain't going to be no fight. There ain't, ain't no fight. You don't right. think so? Especially, what would the arrangement be? be? a lot of hugging. It's not um, a fight. That's exactly it. A lot of hugging. You know, well, you saw the Roy Jones. Yeah, you know, I did. You know, and, you know, the, yeah, there was, to put it euphemistically, a lot of cooperation, mutual cooperation. Yeah, so it's a tacit agreement. I think so. Or you do. It's at least a tacit agreement. And you think that would be like discussed out loud, understood? Probably not. You, you know, I memorialized fights, so in I have papers. mixed feelings about this sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. How you know? how does it? How does one fix a fight? We got a picture of Joe Hip, by the way. With the money. <laughs> Big Indian. There, there it is. is. There's that. There he is. Oh, he's, he's fighting Tommy, Tommy Morrison. Morrison. Got, he got knocked out. Ah, uh, no shit. Probably a left hook, right? <laughs> That's. It, it, it took a long time. I think it went. Nine. Joe Hip was tough as shit. Oh. Yeah. Tough, tough guy. Yeah. I forgot he was Indian. Yeah, Blackfoot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could drink. He could punch. He could get punched. He could drink some more. Yeah. Those, are, those guys, uh, by the way, no no tacit agreements there. I mean, those guys, no. they, they weren't making business decisions back then. They were fucking trading. Yeah. Um, it was a great I want to hear about fixing a yeah. fight. Yeah. How do you fix a fight? There are so many ways to fix a fight. It's, it's, it's a complex question. Money. Uh, money, money. Yeah. Of course. Money. You <laughs> can, if... If you, the easiest way is that you know trainers or managers who work with. You've ter heard the term opponents. Mm -hmm. Okay, opponents come in, and they they know that their job is not to win. Right. So you know let me just finish this for two seconds. So what you do is you go to the gym and you say, "I've got a guy who's looking for some work." And the operative word here is work. Mm -hmm. And they say, "Well, I have somebody who hasn't been in the gym too much. He's good for." three or four rounds, and you say, that's okay, but it would be helpful if we we're a little shorter. Mm -hmm. And you've already, without, without again, explicitly using right. the term fix, right. you've just fixed the fight. Right. A and the number of rounds. So that's one way to do it. You can also buy judges, you mm. can buy referees. Mm. You know, if you have a referee in your corner, they're, they're instructed to stop the fight as fast as possible. How many big fights notable fights have we seen where there's been some interference like we all have seen fights where like how did the judges see it that way or the ref stopped it too fast or is, is this ever go on why is Teddy on Atlas the, so mad yeah on the main it's stage all about, sure, it's of course. all about money it's all about money it's all about money put it like this if you got a fighter and he getting 30 thou or 20 thou he got another fighter he getting a mil two mil you know, going off the back. You didn't have to go to analyze it. Think about it. Whoever's getting the most money like that, that's the winner. That's the one they pick the win. The judges, the judges, sometimes they pay the judges off to. Right. For whoever, right. whoever they want to win, whoever they promote or whatever, they build them. Like, what's that? They just build them up. And, and, and Mitch, how, so, do, and how do the referees work, right? Can you you money can you watch table. a fight and tell if it was sort of breathed on? Mm -hmm. You can. So like you take a, you know, let's say take a Holyfield Tyson's first fight. And it's the, you know, they're just trading mm -hmm. like in in the middle of the ring. Right. And you watch a fight like that. Do you go? <laughs> you can go. That's not fixed because <laughs> they're that's trading. They're that's trading. Right. 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 Re real hard. And then there's 
famously, there was Ali and Sonny Liston, where he got kind of hit with a both, phantom punch. Both, both, both fights are fixed. Both? Both fights are fixed. <laughs> both Ali Liston? Both. Oh, they had a second fight? They had the one, the, the Santa Punch is the second fight. Oh, that's the second fight? Yeah. Oh, so you saw both those were fixed. I know for a fact that both were How do you know that? Because one of the people who was involved in the fix, who was my best friend in boxing, not only told me, he told me who fixed it and why, and it's Boxing 101. It's exactly the kind of story that people who love boxing don't want to know about. <laughs> oh, so what it... Like, how would Sonny Liston have fared if it wasn't fixed, you think? He, he would have won. You think he would have beat Ali? I do. Why is that? Because Ali wasn't fully formed yet. Uh huh. He was on the way up. He was on the way up. And and Liston was a monster. He was kind of a George Foreman of his day. In the he was sense. better than that. Better. He was better than Foreman. Yeah. 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 I I, I think he was the best heavyweight who ever lived. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. So you think Sonny Liston? Now, if Ali got with him five years later, maybe maybe a different story. Sure, because Sonny in the first fight was probably forty. Yeah, his list his age was 31, but he was, he was about 40. Mm. And, uh, and Ali was very, very fast. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think five years later. But both yeah. fights fixed. Of course. And, but with the fight like Ali and Joe Frazier, not. Right? <laughs> certainly they're, they're not. They both almost died, right? Yeah, yeah, certainly not. So part of it is just seeing how much damage these guys take and, and how close to death they get, right? I mean, in the fixing department? Well, yes and no. That, that's an indication that the fight itself is real. If it's right. Fixed, but that doesn't it's, mean necessarily... The judges are right. real. If it's fixed, nine times out of ten, nobody really going to get hurt. They tell you, look, the fifth round... And like you got knocked down or whatever. Right. So before you take all that punishment, they, 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 they lay down. What about Julio Cesar Chavez fighting Meldrick Taylor, Meldrick Taylor, Taylor right. and right. the way that now the ref, ref stopped it. Right. Uh, but he also with, with, was within his rights to stop it. <laughs> Stupid Lou Duva was screaming at him and like distracting him on the side. And oh, Lou man. Duva did a bad piece of coaching too yeah he's like, a ter terrible trainer horrible trainer Ludo was a horrible yeah, trainer yeah, yeah George, because Georgie Benton was their real trainer you got a guy who's way ahead on points right right and he, now you're in the 12th or 15th round right 12th, 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 12th it's the last round right so you just tell your guy just stay away from the guy and then we'll win yeah. and then we'll go home and you're yelling at your guy you gotta get this guy out of here <sighs> which means you gotta go trade with this Mexican fighter who wants you to trade with him because he's way behind on points and you're slick. Meldrick Taylor is super slick. Yep. Could have easily just gotten away. Three minutes. Yes, run the clock Dance out. Dance around. Run the clock out. But no, nope, it goes and trades. It gets caught. They stop it. Two seconds left or whatever. But here's the thing about that fight and this is worth Lou Duva, horrible trainer. Horrible trainer. Wow. But, but Richard Steele. Yeah, I know. You started with them, right? Yeah, yeah tomorrow, with, with Charlie Finkel. To tomorrow's champion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah tomorrow's champion. No, um, Richard Steele was Don King's guy. So oh. Richard Steele is the ref. Yeah. Now remember, when, when Meldrick Taylor gets dropped in the last round, there were fewer than 10 seconds to go in the fight, right? Right. And he's dropped in a corner. Right. And he gets up. Now remember, the red lights are on. When the red lights go on, there were 10 seconds left 10 in the fight. 10 seconds left in the Julio fight. Julio Cesar Chavez is across the ring. He couldn't possibly... Neutral corner. He couldn't possibly get back to, to hit Taylor again. Right. And... Richard Steele is a vastly experienced referee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he knows that the other guy, Chavez, of course, is King's guy, mm -hmm. is not going to land another punch, can't possibly land another punch. Right. And he stops the fight anyway. Mm. So that makes sense for you. <laughs> for me. Yeah. Oh, God, I got so many questions. We didn't take a quick break. Mitch and Charles are going to hang out with us, and we'll get into more of it right after this. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Oh, Auto parts, well, they're in the business of keeping your car on the road. O'Reilly offers friendly, helpful service and parts and knowledge you need to do all your own maintenance and repairs. They've got thousands of parts and accessories in stock, either in store or online, so you never have to worry. If you're in a jam, they'll help you out. When you're a do-it-yourself or need a specialty tool to finish the job, well, stop by O'Reilly and uh, ask for one of their loaner tool programs because there's a lot of real special tools 
when it comes to doing certain jobs on cars. Simply pay a refundable deposit and borrow the right tool, then get the deposit back when it's returned, so it's free. They'll help you find the right part or point you to the nearest local repair shop for help. Plus, they can test your battery for free in or out of the car so you don't have to pop it out. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts are your one-stop shop for all things auto and You can find what you need in the store or online. Stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit O'ReillyAuto.com slash Adam. That's O'ReillyAuto.com slash Adam. Mitch Blood Green is with us. Charles Farrell is with us uh, going over boxing. I had no idea. I assumed it was corrupt. I I, I didn't know some of the fights were fixed. I'd heard the Ali uh, fight. Which fight did you have as fixed? My fight. We had nine. Uh, how many fights did you have? Twenty something. Yeah, twenty something. But what I'm saying is, my fight, my fight with Tyson was fixed. Well, fixed in that, but not traditionally fixed in a different way. You yeah, weren't, you weren't able to prepare. You were aware of it. Huh? Oh, but but, but you, the only way you could you could beat him was you had to knock him out, right? Because you knew the judges right, were right, on his right. side. Right, right, right. After I found out what was going on, to Don King slammed both of us up. I was his fighter. When I got to New York, I found out that he signed both of us up. So when he lose, he still got control. But he was playing me off. And the switches, my spawn points weren't getting paid. Everything to, 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 to defeat me, this guy put it. My spawn points weren't getting paid. I wasn't getting paid. I wasn't getting my t-shirts, my switches, or nothing. The trainer, I had to go to, down to the ring by myself. In the morning, they had a car pick him up, take, take him to Central Park. I got up, because I did what I had to do. I jogged the street. I ran. And I'm telling you, the room they put me in, it went for my mom's. I thought I was going to walk out. Said, so just a room. Talk to God. How long? Not long. We got little, little quotes. But anyway, if it, and I'm just cutting. Your mom got to be a good fighter. Your mom's on, you got to be on the fight. If somebody got killed right. or hurt, they wouldn't tell me. So I don't right. throw me off the fight. So you have to have a right frame of mind. Now I'm arguing about everything. So that was, that was how they that's how they it. Mm. And it's I know when you two one one guy said, I knew what I was getting. I knew what I was getting, I knew what he was getting. That's what pissed me off. So that, that right there is just like a fix. And then the, the the trainer, like I said, I had no trainer. My trainer that I was training with in the camp in Ohio, I come to New York. Now I got another trainer working in my corner. I'm like, come on, man. Well, there's more uh, to it than that, too. Mitch, talk yeah, about yeah. It, the thing with, with uh, Jose Torres and with, and, um, what's, his, uh, what's his name? Eddie Pelé. Eddie, Eddie uh, Larry Merchant. Eddie right? Pelé. Mm. Larry Merchant, the guy who called all those fights. Yeah. You can't, do you can't fight if your mind ain't right. And I'm sitting there arguing about my money, arguing about what they're doing to me, and I still took it. Give me some heavyweight <laughs> rankings, Charles. You got Sonny Liston at the oh, top. I got Sonny Liston at the top, yeah. Where do you got the Klitsch goes? N- not, uh, I mean, the, the good fighters, he but not, me down. not anywhere near the top ten. He turned me Nowhere down. Nowhere near? No. Oh, Klitsch What about Lennox Lewis? Uh, Somewhere around number eight or nine. <laughs> Where do you got Mike Weaver? Not in the top hundred. I, work, I, 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 Mike I, I love Mike Weaver. Did you, did you get along? He's a wonderful guy. He's a nice guy. Nice guy. And if you see him with a shirt off, it's like, oh my God. No steroids either. A different planet kind of physique on that guy. Yeah, yeah no steroids. No steroids. Touched by the hand of God. And they all turned me down. They had to say, step in a. If I fight one fight, now, one fight, if I get a fight, and that's supposed to give me a rematch. Well, let me tell you this. Hmm. I, had a, I found a criminal charge on Tyson. On I Tyson? Went, yeah, I won't take the street. I won't take the street in my own hand. Because he fight. punched you in the eye, right? That's right, yeah. So they told me I'm going to do that, do it the right way. File charges. I found a criminal charge on them. They called me and they kept calling my, the, the people I know. If I drop the charges, he'll give me a fight. He'll fight me. 
That's oh, really? I, that's all I wanted to hear. Right. I, I got the contract. She was, it said a letter of intent when they the contract. So I didn't know that. So I dropped it. And this punk said, no, I don't. So got your drop it, then he said no. No, he started trying to do that fight. No. <laughs> uh, Bert yeah, Cooper, man. Charles. Bert Cooper. Oh, yeah. Bert <laughs> Cooper is. <laughs> The scariest puncher. Yeah, he's he a tough. Need. He was a tough dude. I don't believe this guy. Burt Cooper looked taste. like the dad from the black sitcom with the address in it from like the eighties or nineties. There's a black Good actor. Two two seven. Two two seven. I think I, there's a there's a black actor who played a dad in like sitcoms that you would recognize who looked like Burt Cooper. You guys don't know the name of Burt Cooper. Tough as shit, though. Hal Williams? Probably Hal Williams. Uh, you can Google me right when you find a picture of Burt Cooper and Hal Williams. But yes. I managed a guy who fought Burt Cooper. Yeah. yeah Tyrone Booz, who was the cruiserweight champ. Mm -hmm. He said that years and years later, he, he continued to have night. He went 12 rounds with him, didn't get mm -hmm. dropped. Mm -hmm. He said he continued to have nightmares about having to fight Burt Cooper. He said it just it dominated his dreams. And he said he, he punched so hard that when he hit you, it didn't hurt. Mm. He said, you went into this weird dimension. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, you didn't know where you were. And I once asked Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, who you know, mm -hmm. about Burt Cooper. And he said, did you ever see The Exorcist? And I said, sure. He said, you remember the, the way the girl's head spins? Said, That's what it's like being hit by Burt Cooper. <laughs> yeah, there's, so there's all these guys that nobody, they're, they're lost to history. Right. People don't know their names. They know Larry Holmes and Muhammad Ali, and they know like the top ten guys. and yeah. the, the, They know the Sugar Ray Leonards and stuff. But then there's that whole sort of second tier of the Joe Hips and the Burt Coopers and those, even Tommy Morrison and guys like right. that. They're just like, They didn't quite make the top cut and so people don't really know who they are but the stories are crazy and yeah. interesting that are attached to those guys well oliver mccall you oliver know, mccall right did he have the nervous breakdown in the ring in the ring started crying yes <laughs> he he you know you know you know oliver yeah. oliver mccall was finding a klitschko i think was he finding a klitschko or was he fighting for let's see was he finding klitschko or was he finding Lennox Lewis. He knocked, Lennox he, knocked out, Lewis. he knocked out Lennox Lewis. He knocks out Lennox Lewis. He's the only guy who really took Lennox Lewis down back in the day. And then they have a rematch. Right. And in the middle of the fight, he just has a nervous breakdown and starts crying. And says, Lewis wins. And, Lewis in the wins. corner. Well, he puts his hands to his sides. You right. remember this? And, yeah. and, and he lets Lewis punch him. And he doesn't budge. Mm -hmm. That was the strange thing. He's, hit, he's getting hit by Lewis's good shots. Why? What happened with him? He was right out of rehab. Mm. He was, I think, about four days out of rehab. Yeah. Oh, it's a way to schedule a fight. <laughs> and then there's Ike Bayabuchi. Oh, come on. Scariest. Oh. Ike Bayabuchi. Oh, you believe I used to train? Now you know I know, right? You know, yeah. Yeah, He's he got out of prison. He's out. I He's know. Out. I know. He wants to fight. He does? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, is Ike... 50? 45? He's 50. He's 50? He's 50? Yeah. But I mean, by, you know, by today's standards. He's fresh. <laughs> he's a kid. <laughs> a new kid on the block. Yeah, no problem. I could be, I, uh, yeah, man. You wonder if one of the Paul brothers would fight I could be a Bucci. That they shouldn't do. That they shouldn't do, <laughs> no, right? He right. was the scariest heavyweight ever, right? Terrifying. But, but really uh, certifiably insane, right? Oh, yeah. I could be a Bucci. Yeah. Yeah. I could totally be a Bucci. I had a mom that was crazy, thought there were, you know, bad winds were blowing in through the air conditioning system and right. stuff. I mean, he was like a native from a different land, right? Yeah. No, no, he was. Well, you, but you remember, he fought, he beat David Tua, who was, uh, again, arguably one of the hardest punchers ever. And they went 12 rounds. Yeah. And neither one of them budged. Right. Just astonishing fight. Yeah, Tua was like Samoan, like Australian, or something. He's Samoan. Yeah, I mean, he was a he was a tough dude. A lot of these fighting names I seen turned me down. Nobody me, wanted to fight me. him. I would do it all. Nobody no one wanted, wanted to fight Mitch Blood Green. No, because because if Mitch were motivated, if he wanted to fight, you know you're not going to knock him out. You know you're not going to knock him down. He's got fast hands. Right. right? 
Yeah, if I wasn't friends with them, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Well, a lot of them guys. Oh God. You want to find me? No, no, no. I'm trying to think. I, I, had, I had several managers pick me up to give me a fight with Tyson. So they figured me. They knew the, the, me and Tyson fight. A rematch with me and Tyson would have been one of the biggest fights in the century. But, the world. but, I, but I got you a rematch yeah. with with Tyson that you didn't take. Oh really? Yes. Oh, what? Right. What happened? You and I was. Oh, lean up under the mic. Okay. Yeah, Mitch. I, I ain't gonna give me a power time. And didn't you didn't take it. Yeah, that's your mind. Don't, don't talk about this no more. Can you lie? <laughs> I'm not lying. 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 i am not lying i am i am not lying i am not lying i am not lying i I'm telling you. Yeah, when the fuck that fool, you lost your mind. How the fuck fool people? You know that? What year did you get him the rematch? This was right after. I, I was part of the. Oh, hell no. no. <laughs> <laughs> ain't no way. Ain't no I'm, way. Ain't I'm no telling way. you, oh, man. Now I'll fight that for you, 3,000 years. I want, I, want, I want him to just that bad. Man, yeah, you, you said to you said me. A million dollars. All right, what year? This would have been 1995. Oh, no. Oh, okay, I can give so. you the. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. My best friend in boxing was a guy named Al Braverman. And Al yeah. Braverman was Don King's director of boxing. Mm -hmm. Tyson is in prison. Mm -hmm. Tyson's going to come out of prison. And I went and fought him. You didn't? I, I, All right, let's I, hear the story. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, no way. Yeah, Mitch is just finding out about this. Too. Yeah, he's <laughs> not just finding yeah, out. Yeah, you're right. I ain't never heard that. Me and I, I lost his mind. All right, go oh, ahead. So what happened? All right, so Tyson is in prison, and mm -hmm. he's ballooned up. He mm -hmm. can't fight. Mm -hmm. He's in prison because, because Don King knows he puts him on ice mm -hmm. because he's dissipating. He's falling apart. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's going to get beat by another guy like, like you know, Buster Douglas. Mm -hmm. It kills his marketability. Yeah. Okay. So they put him in, and he's coming out, and he's supposed to fight Oliver McCullough. Mm -hmm. Who's the champ and who does business sometimes? Does business, yeah. being plays ball. Yeah. Yep. But Oliver McCall is a loose cannon. Mm -hmm. You never know what he's going to do. No and kidding. Oliver McCall will kill you if he wants to. Right. You know, another, another guy's never been off his feet, by the way. Oliver McCall. Oliver McCall. Mm -hmm. So he, they're going to have Peter McNeely fight Oliver McCall for the heavyweight championship. Signed, the seal, delivered. It's on 40, yeah. 30 rock we go. And King sees the two of them up and says, wait a minute, this can't happen because nobody will believe it. Right. And then they realize it doesn't matter whether Tyson is the champion when he gets out of prison. He's still the most interesting guy, people, right? Mm -hmm. Very simple. So I say to Al Braverman, how about Mitch Green? Mm -hmm. And he goes, you're crazy. Yeah. I said, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. he doesn't want to remember this. And I said, we'll bring Mitch to, to the prison to talk to Tyson. They, they would. Mm, all right, here we I go. I know, I, I remember you told me that. And I said, <laughs> so what, what? I said, just hit him. No way just hit him. And when you get out, that's the, that's the fight that people will want. Oh, so no, say hi what, to Tyson, they, they, prison punch. They want that, the idiot, right. mm -hmm. that, that doesn't make the fight so big. They want to see that. That's how I got with you. They, 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 they fought in the ring, they would fought in the street. They could rematch in the garage match. Mm. Right. That, that was already, that, they had promoters overseas over $20 million for me in this no got the fight. And he Somebody said, no. $20 million? Yeah, the promoters, the promoters trying to get the fight me and Tyson. So, and he I wish said, someone no. had told me that. Mc, I, McNeely ends up fighting Tyson, right? Right. right. Yeah, who was oh, just a God, pure tomato can, right? Just, just, the guy. Just, the guy. just the guy. Just the guy. Yeah. All right, good news. We have a picture of Hal Williams from 227. Oh. And Bert, Bert Cooper? And Bert like. Cooper. Well, <laughs> we got one where the guy's in his 70s, and, I, I, and one where a guy's in his 20s. Right. I mean, it'd be good to get the picture where they're in the same decade of life. Well, you know what I'm saying, Bert fellas? Never, Bert I, I never know. made it to that decade of life. Oh, he didn't. No. He died. Yeah. Bert's got silver hair and it's old. 
in this picture. And, and I mean, I'm sorry. Hal. Hal does. And then Bert Cooper is like, this is Olympic trials. Yeah. Uh, Man, no. Okay. Yes. But so do a better um, job of the, at least the ages it? being about uh, the same. Because you said, how much does he get? You see, Chris, you can sit here now <laughs> and, and listen to this. Like I, I can see I wish hilarious. you told me that. <laughs> yeah, well, you would see more if they were not 50 <laughs> years apart. All right, we'll get a better yeah. no picture. No one in the world, me, not. I said, well, I'm a song I got. I don't fuck four people. I fuck a gorilla bear for me, not. Who's, uh, what other big fight was fixed in your mind? Fixed? Well,. <sighs> I'm trying to think which, which would be the biggest fights that were fixed. Both List and Ali fights. Both doesn't get are, too much bigger are than probably that. probably the biggest. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I used to the think the Tyson fights was fixed. Which one? That's what I asked. Him. That's how I got to fight with him. This guy's knocked the guy out. One round, one round, one round. I thought, I thought that was just half of them things was fixed. And that's a high little man. He's just knocking everybody out like that. That's why that's I kept telling Don King, let me get this. Oh, man, I ain't know nothing about him. Uh, knock everybody one round, one round. That still threw me off. Do you think Tyson's stuff was fixed? Yeah, Leading yeah, up yeah. to his fight, even. Leading yeah, up. All right, of, what do you think? Is there another big fight that you think was fixed? Nah, yeah. No, um, nah, nah. Do you remember the, the, the first Pacquiao-Tim Bradley fight? Yes. Okay. You, and you remember how the fight went? Very, very easy win for Pacquiao. Yeah. And he loses the decision. Tim Bradley, bald black man from the desert, maybe Palm yeah. Springs or That's something like that. Yeah. That's the guy. Mm -hmm. You think it's, that one was caught? I, well, I think what happened with that one was a betting coup. Mm -hmm. You know, so what happens is that Pacquiao loses the fight. A couple of times he takes his foot off the pedal a little bit to make mm -hmm. sure he doesn't, because he had, he had Tim in a little bit of trouble, mm -hmm. so he stops. Mm -hmm. He loses a decision that everyone in the world sees that he won. Mm -hmm. So the betting thing goes through, and he loses no credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, you can watch and kind of tell if yeah. there's an agreement or not. Well, there were, in a sense, there was no agreement. I mean, certainly, Bradley doesn't know anything about it. And generally speaking, when you're talking about fixing fights, the winners I mean, never know. The winners you don't, don't tell know. The winners. Interesting. Yeah. All right, we That's got the one where Teddy Atlas just went nuts afterwards. Oh, I love like, Teddy yeah. Atlas. All right, we have another picture of Burt Cooper and Hal <laughs> Williams. Get closer. All right, so is there a color picture of Burt Cooper? Is there a, Coop, a, Bert, a picture of Burt Cooper that's in color? I guess that would help. What are you trying to say? Look that, that would help. It's doing, yeah. it's doing better, but you're showing us a black and white picture and then a color picture, so there's going to be... This is better, though. The, this no. is better, except for... Does a, is there a color picture of Burt Cooper, I guess is what I'm asking. It's tough Don't to find a head-on one, but we're still looking. Oh, you Probably can. fight. Yeah, fine, fine for his fights. Anyway, um, let me give a plug, by the way. Low Life, a memoir of jazz, fight fixing, and the mob. That's, uh, that's the book. Um, also, uh, The Legend of Mitch Blood Green and Other Boxing Essays. That's coming soon? That's coming in a few months, yeah. Mm. Um, I know they're talking to TV networks as well, trying to get some... Makes sense. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, target-rich environment, those those days, these fighters, just some of the guys we've talked about. I mean, it's it's yeah. definitely worth a look. Well, we're hoping, you know, I mean, you know, Mike Tyson's we're about right. to fight on Netflix. Well, how about a series on Netflix? Yeah. You know? I'd watch. If things go through... Don't say that. Don't don't mention you gave the house over a million dollars and I turned it down. Ain't no way. I don't fight. I don't fight that Trump for nothing. He did. Wait, you were just pissed that you got thirty. Now you go nothing. I was chasing Tyson every way. Every time before, I was at the fight trying to get him. I was going to see my friends, homeboys, all the stuff. I was trying to degrade him, to make him mad. I couldn't get him mad. I tell you, get that man to fight me. I I know that. I know, I know that, it but, well. But <laughs> I took it I'm going with Charles on this one. Mitch and I were a both totally broke at the time, and I said, "Please don't turn down a million dollars." And, and, <laughs> and he said, "No." He said, no, no, how, no, "How much is he getting?" And I obfuscated a little bit. I said, "I don't know." And he said, "Is he getting more than me?" And I said, 
probably. Yeah. And, uh, I'm getting midnight. Like I know, oh, man. I don't believe. All right. Uh, I'm going to be in West Palm Beach coming <laughs> up this weekend at the Kennel man. Club doing stand up Friday and Saturday. You can go to amcrow.com for all the live shows. Mitch Blood Green. Keep an eye on him. He's going to be popping up on Netflix soon, I'm sure. Charles Farrell. Interesting. Going going through memory lane with you on some of these crazy heavyweights from back in the day. So, until next time, it's Adam Crow for Charles and Mitch and Chris saying mahalo.